So I was planning on doing a revision lecture. I was working on something last night. I asked myself, if I had to teach everyone vector calculus in two hours, would I be able to do that? So I had an idea for the 13th week where I would just give like a crash course in vector calculus. Like what is the minimum amount of things that you need to know in order to be able to answer the questions on the exam? Would that be something like interesting? Oh, that wasn't a question, that was just a thumbs up. Okay, so I'll give one, um, but it's usually the case for these revision things that I'll do a ton of work and then like six people show up. But I guess if six people show up, it will be, it will still be, still be worth it, but, that, but that's my plan. So for the 13th week then, bring questions if, if you want them addressed. But otherwise I'm just gonna give a sort of, now that we know everything, like I'm gonna go to the very beginning and just write out everything using vectors. And then you'll see how I can basically compress the whole course into one or two pages. So, uh, okay, we'll do that for week 13. We will be, I'll have to, I just have to confirm that I indeed still have the room. I think it's the case that I still have the, this room specifically. Um, is there anything else you, you want me to address at the review lecture specifically? Do you guys have access to the old exams yet? Yes, okay, so why don't you try taking a look at those before the review session and identify any of those questions that are difficult or, um, so that you should be working together to try to solve as many of the questions that we've given you, right? Because the exam is going to be a subset of the, uh, the questions that you have available to you. And they'll certainly be the same flavor, right? So really the best way to, to, to prepare for the exam is to, just to do as many possible, as many questions as you as you feasibly can. When I was in school, I, I went through all the questions in the textbook, and then I went through them all again, and I did every question twice. Right? And I did pretty good, good enough to, to sit here teaching you. Actually, I was failing vector calculus until I took the exam. <laughs> I aced the exam, right? So, at least enough to be able to, t to teach you. All right, so let's start. So this week we're gonna be talking about surface integrals and we're almost done. So after surface integrals, next week we're gonna do um, Stokes and Divergence Theorem and that will more or less constitute um, vector calculus, right? That is, we will, will have given you all the tools to do vector calculus and, and there's really not much more to it. Um, so you can be glad that you had learned, uh, you've learned the subject basically to the, to the very end. And you'll, you'll have a comprehensive understanding of, of simple calculus. Okay, so the relationship between surface integrals and surface area is analogous to the relationship between a line integral and an arc length. So this is important. Right? Remember that when we're taking an arc, le arc length, what we're doing is we're measuring, um, whoops, right? If we have some curve C, the arc length right, is equal to the length of this line. A line integral is different. A line integral says, if you can give me a line uh, in the plane, right, this corresponds to another line along a surface, and then to calculate this curtain, this is um, the line integral. Okay. So here, the surface integral or the surface area is like um, is like asking for the length of a line rather than this line that has a curtain underneath it, right? So. Just keep that in mind when we're talking about um, surface integrals versus line integrals. So we're gonna define the surface integral over S so that it is equal to the surface area of S uh, when we're taking the surface integral over the unit function, right, which will become clear later. Right, but, but in here, the arc length of a curve C was equal to the line integral of that same curve C over the function one. Okay. So we start with the parametric surface and then extend to the special case where S is the graph, right? So first we're gonna talk about doing 
surface integrals over regions that are easier to represent. So for example, right, if S is a surface and the surface is given by the vector equation R, which takes two parameters and gives you a vector back, right, so you take two things and you give me back in, in three, right, so an example could be mapping from the unit sphere using two angles into the rectangular um, Cartesian system, which gives you three points. And for this lecture, I'm going to use this notation for partial derivatives. Um, because this, well, writing r when r is a vector sub u uh, is the same thing as writing the partial derivative of r with respect to the partial derivative of u. And if p, q, and r are the components of r, this capital R, um, then this partial derivative propagates across the vector like this. Right? So just, just because it's a lot cleaner, this lecture we're going to be using this definition or this notation for partial derivatives. This is the precise definition of a surface integral. So if S is a surface given parametrically, then the surface integral over F is the parametric, the surface integral of F over the parametric surface S is given by this sum int. Right, so again, we're just saying that when we write this double integral, right, this is equivalent to this infinite sum which is the game we've been playing all semester, basically. Right, so the double integral over this region S of some function over small changes in, in that patch over the surface is equal to the limit of, of m and n goes to infinity of i equals 0 to m, j equals 1 to n of the function uh, evaluated at some sample point uh, multiplied by the approximate area of a piece of that patch. Okay, so this is not very meaningful, but let's draw a bunch of pictures. Okay, so what you have to imagine here is that you have some surface, right? And you have a portion of the surface for which you want the area, right? So if you, if you say I want the area of this on the surface and you project that into R2, right? You're going to be given your R, right? We're going to define a region in UV which defines a surface on top of it, right? So the thing on underneath is in R2, and the thing that comes out is in R3. It's a 3D surface. So the picture I have here is the thing that's in R2, right? This is a patchwork that we're putting underneath the surface, right? And in this patchwork, we're going to divide it up into sub-rectangles like this and call this the R I J sub-rectangle. Uh, and it's going to have area given by approximately the change in u, so that's the base, times the change in v, which, which is the height. Um, if we take a sample point from the r i, the r -I j th, sorry, you can take a sample point from the i j th rectangle, like such, um, using these asterisks that we've been using for sample points. So we're going to take u i v j from u and v, then give it to R, which gives us a point in, in three space, right? So we have this transformation between U, V, and, and the surface. Okay, so imagine, right, this is the thing that's on the ground. We've picked a point in it, and now we want to look at where this point ends up on the surface, right? So if the point we picked on the plane was U, I, asterisk, V, I, a V, J, asterisk, then if we give it to R, U, this gives us a point in, in three space, right? Our surface was S, it's given by this vector equation, and we discussed a few lectures back that we can approximate the area of this rectangle here by taking the cross product of this vector and this vector. Right? Remember from your linear algebra that if you want the area given by, if you want the area of a parallelogram given by two vectors, that's equal to the length of the normal. And so we discussed a little bit um, three lectures ago that the area of this square here, or this really this trapezoid, this rectangle, um, is approximately equal to the cross product, which is here, uh, which we can rewrite as this, right, because these are scalar constants that can re we can remove. Now, if you look, um, this component here that I highlighted from here, Right, so I'm trying to turn this integral into something else. 
by uh, uh, equating it to its definition. And then we have this term here, f evaluated at some sample point times delta Sij. That's equal to this term here. Right? So that's why I colored this cyan. We're going to be able to drop this component into that limit. Right? So we, we have approximately that f evaluated at this sample point, delta Sij, is approximately equal to the same function f evaluated at a point given by r, ui bj, uh, multiplied by the length of the cross product of these two vectors, delta u, delta v. So the following allows for the computation of surface integrals via conversion to a double integral over not necessarily a rectangular region d. And as, as always, this will become more evident as we start doing more practical examples. Right, but this, this, is, this, is the this is really the only thing that you need to remember to do a surface integral. Right? That if you have S, a surface, and you can parameterize this surface by a vector function, R, then the double integral over the surface uh, given by F is equal to the double integral over D given by F evaluated at RUV times the length of the cross product of RU and RV. Right? We, and provided that this D that we're given is a rectangular region in one of the systems, uh, we're going to be able to take that integral. Okay, so notice this proposition is similar to the formula for line integrals. Right, the integral um, over a curve of F, right, this is what, this is the area under the, this is the curtain area, right, you, ha you have some C, uh, in R2, which defines a line on a surface, and we take the area under that line. Uh, this was equal to the integral from A to B of F applied at RT times the length of this normal vector. Right? So these two, this is really the analog for this. Right? And it's unsurprising that we can, we can keep moving higher and higher if you want. But um, does anyone know how to take a cross product beyond three dimensions? It's called the tensor, and I hate tensors. They're a disaster. You physicists will learn how to, how to use tensors, right? This notion, because uh, physicists will have to work, if you want to do string theory, which is really the only physics they're studying at this moment, they, they stop, I think, what is it, 13 dimensions, 12 dimensions? It's three spatial dimensions, a time dimension, and then eight more for some odd reason, right? But in this system, you need to be able to manipulate higher dimensional vectors. So you're gonna have, you'll have to take all of this and, and generalize it even further. But for most of us, working in 3D is, is sufficient. Right? This, is, this is the universe that we exist in. Corollary, right? that is something, a result that's fairly immediate. The double integral over the surface of, of one, uh, by our definition, is equal to the double integral over D, uh, the length of this normal, dA. Right? That's the surface area. Why was this a corollary? Well, because we just have to look at our previous proposition and stick in one for f, x, y, and z. And, and, and this result comes out fairly immediately. Okay, so here's our first uh, example, which hopefully will make things more concrete. Um, compute the surface integral of x squared, where s is the unit sphere. Okay, so since we're computing over the unit sphere, it's probably best to use spherical notation to represent uh, our region S, right? So x squared is our f, uh, and s is the thing that we need to parameterize as r. And so in, in spherical, the unit sphere is given by, uh, if you give me a phi, uh, I think that's azimuthal, and theta, the other muthal, um, why don't we need three? So in spherical, we normally have three components, r, phi, and theta. Right? Why is it that we, we only need two components here? r is one, r is a constant. Right, so this is going to be uh, typical in these questions, uh, that we're gonna be, we're gonna give a, be given a sphere of, sp of fixed radius, or a cylinder of fixed radius, right? allowing us to drop one of the pr parameters. So in any case, we can, parameterize the unit sphere using only two components, phi and theta, uh, which means that R specifically um, is given by sine phi cos theta, sine phi, sine theta, cos phi. 
Okay, so now what do we need? Okay, so I said the only thing um, that we're going to need to remember is this, right? That the double integral over the surface of x, y, z, ds, is equal to the double integral over d, f, r, u, v, times the length of this cross product. Okay? Where the relationship between d and s is given, given this way. So s is a collection of points, uh, which is specifically given by r, u, v, such that u, v is in d. Right? This is the relationship between d and s. Right? d has to be the collection of points which you give to r in order to generate all of s. Right? That this is how, right, that th this is what we're doing. We're saying we have this integral which we have no idea how to compute, but we can transform it into another integral for which we do know how to compute. Right? So given this, um, we now need to find this cross product. Okay, so, and this cross product is a mess. So let's do it once, because right, it comes up a lot. And I'm going to attempt to do it in writing. Um, and if I get in trouble, I have the answer on, on, on the slide. Okay, so let, let's just have a little side proposition here. Uh, we want to know, uh, suppose R phi theta parameterizes a radius, and let's say it's a radius A sphere, then uh, we want to know what R phi cross R theta is. All right, and I'll, I'll fill this in when we're done. Oops. Okay. You guys will have to help me, right? Because this is going to be to be complicated. Okay, so if we have R U, oh sorry. If we have R phi theta is equal to what? We have A sine phi cos theta. A sine phi sine theta and A cos phi. Right? This should be a parameterization of, of the sphere, if I remember correctly. What then is R phi? Well, this is this vector um, where each component has the partial derivative taken in phi. Right? So the first one is what? And please help me not make sign mistakes. Uh, A cos phi cos theta. A cos phi sine theta and minus a sine phi. I think you guys already let me made a, make a mistake. Should that be negative? Or should be negative? Or should be positive? Well, what's the derivative of this with respect to phi? What's the derivative of sine with respect? What's the derivative of sine phi with respect to phi? Cos, right? So I shouldn't have put a negative there. Right? So the, the first one should have been a cos phi cos theta. I have to be very. You'll you'll see how enormous this this um, cross product gets. Okay, so let's try r. Th whoops. R theta, which is what? Okay, so minus a sine phi sine theta, a sine phi, whoops, cos theta, and what's the last one? Zero. Okay. So now we want r phi cross r theta. So what's this? Okay, so this is going to be a cos phi cos, and now I regret using portrait. Uh, this is going to be a cos phi sine theta, and then minus i sine phi. This is going to be minus a sine phi sine theta, a sine phi cos theta, zero. And then our components i, j, k. Okay. 
what is in the first component. Okay. That is, we eliminate this row in this column, and we take the determinant of what's left. So that's 0 minus minus a squared sine squared phi cos theta. What's the next one? Well, that's, that's what we're going to get if we eliminate this row in this column and then take the determinant of what's left and then negate it. And so that's going to be positive a, positive a squared sine squared phi sine theta. That's this minus 0. Okay, what goes in the last one? Well, it's, it's the determinant of what's left if we cross out this and this. So that's going to give us what? A squared uh, cos phi sine phi cos squared theta plus A squared cos phi sine phi sine squared theta. And I think I can simplify this a bit. This is going to be A squared. I'll just take that out sine squared phi cos theta, sine squared phi sine theta. And then here, let us realize that there's a cos squared here and a sine squared there. And what's left here is a, whoops, whoops, whoops. What's left here is a constant, right? So the third component is going to be what? A squared cos phi sine phi. Okay. So let's see if we, if we did it right up here. So I predict, oh, that A shouldn't be there. So if I'm right, this should work out to what? Sine squared phi cos theta, sine squared phi sine theta, cos phi sine phi, right? Because A is one. So let's hope I have done this correctly. Uh, I think I did one extra thing here. I also took the length. Right, so if we move, so if you see up to here, I am correct. Right. Sine squared phi cos theta, sine squared phi sine theta, cos phi sine phi. Okay, so we're good. This is good up to what I put on the board. Now if we take the length of this, it's the square root of the sum of squares. So there are the, there's the square root of the sum of squares. You can see a sine fourth and a sine fourth, uh, a cos squared and a sine squared, right? So the cos and the sine squared will disappear, le leaving one sine to the power of four phi, uh, plus a cos squared phi sine squared phi. So that's what we're left with. Okay, so we need to remember for this question, the one we're working on right now, we have r phi cross r theta is equal to the square root of sine more phi plus cos squared phi sine squared phi. All right. So what's next, right? Remember, we have to do, we're doing this. I wish I could point at this and have it point up there, but uh, it's, it's this equation that we are trying to use, right? So we have calculated this, so now we just need to evaluate f at RUV. So f in this case is x squared, right? So f of x, y, z is x squared, right? This means that if I take f and I evaluate it at r v theta, what do we get? What was our x component of r? Our x component was sine phi cos theta, right? So here we should be getting sine squared phi cos squared theta, which I have up there, multiplied by the length of this cross product, which we just calculated. Um, so if you Simplify that, we're going to have the double integral over d sine cube phi cos squared theta sine phi. 
dA. Okay, so what our S was the unit sphere. Our D is now a new coordinate system where we're using phi and theta to describe points on that sphere. So what is D? Right, the unit sphere are all those points that satisfies x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. Right, if I move from that coordinate system into one which is just describing points on the sphere by two angles, what are, what are the ranges of those angles? Zero to pi, zero to two pi, right? We have phi, which remember is giving us height, right? Phi equals zero is the highest, phi equals pi is the lowest, right? So we have to do one full sweep of phi, and theta is giving us the where, where are we positioned on, on the circle, right? And we can go anywhere. Right? This is the surface of the sphere, without r, without a, a parameter r saying we need to go from zero to one, right? When we're doing triple integrals, we said zero to one, zero to pi, zero to two pi, to take the volume of the sphere. We needed to account for everything from the center of the sphere outward. Now we're only interested in the surface, right? So we don't need an r parameter moving, it's fixed at one, right? So we can take our d uh, and replace it with a rectangular polar, uh, rectangular spherical region, right? Where phi has to go from zero to pi and theta has to go from zero to two pi. Uh, and we just continue. So this sort of, looks hard, but let's break this up into the integral including phi's and the integral including thetas. That gives us something that looks like this. And did I apply any tricks? Um, so the integral of cos squared theta is one half one plus cos two theta. There are two ways of doing this. You can convert, you can use your double angle uh, formulas, or you can just write down what the, like we, the integral of cos squared comes up so often. You should put it in your formula sheet. You should put all the squares in, in, your, in your formula sheet. The second one looks hard, but um, it's easy if you just sort of, or no, no. I cheated in both things, right? This was a square, this was a cube, I just looked it up in, in the tables. If you wanted to work through, you'd have to do double angle formulas, but that, that was something that um, was only relevant last year. And so from here to here, I used the tables. After this, um, should there be integrals here? I think I screwed something up. Can I screw something up? Okay, forgive me. I didn't use the tables. I used the double angle formula here and here to actually conduct the integral properly, right? So if I, if I take this cos squared theta and replace it with its double angle formula, I get this, and I can replace a cube actually with, a, with another trig identity uh, to collapse out all of the, the cubes. When we do that, you just, these integrals are easy. So the integral of one half uh, one plus cos two theta is theta plus one half sine two theta. We have to take that from zero to two pi. Um, this looks like it should, require product rule, but consider that if we put a cos cubed, if we take the derivative of this, you're gonna get three cos squared uh, plus chain rule, chain rule will give you this sign, and so this is actually fine. So this integrates to this. Um, when we actually work out the numbers, it comes out to four pi thirds. That shouldn't be too hard to compute when, when you put it in. All right, so we had three, uh, there are three components to this question, right? Taking our S and figuring out a parameterization in uh, one less variables, R. Uh, then we had to find the cross product of uh, R when we take the partial derivatives in both of the directions. Uh, and then we had to take F and evaluate it at R and then, and then do these integrals, right? But the technique and the scheme will be the same every time. Okay, so now we want to move from surfaces given by a parameter to those surfaces given by graphs. Okay. This is actually not necessary, period. Right? We already have the mathematics to do this. Right? Any graph is also a parameterized function. Right? Consider this, right? A graph, right? what we mean by graph is basically functions, plottable surfaces, right? So a graph would always have something that looks like this. 
So if we have some graph, which is a, cur a surface given by this, what is the obvious way to parameterize this? Well, it's a vector function given by this. Right? Which is a parameterization of the surface in two parameters. Any function is trivially param parameterizable in this, in this way. Okay, so keeping this in mind, we're just going to come up with specific formulas, um, assuming that the surface that we're given looks like this, right? Assume that the surface you're given is given to you by z is equal to some function of g and x, right? And, and this will simplify things somewhat. Why will it simplify things? Well, given that our surface is given by a f function of two variables, I can parameterize that surface S by this R, right, U, V, or X, Y, if you prefer, um, and then Z, right? When this is the case, when we take the derivative or the partial derivative of R along both of its directions, the partial derivative of R with respect to U is what? One, zero, the partial derivative of G with respect to U. Similarly, if we do it with V, the partial derivative of R with respect to V gives you what? Zero, one, partial derivative of g, partial derivative of, no. The der partial derivative of g with respect to v is, is the third component. So that, okay, so what, what does our cross product work out to? We, we have zeros, right, so we expect that we're gonna have some type of simplification. So that's how you set it up, right? Uh, the unit component vectors across the top, then ru, then rv. Um, let's just figure out what the first component here should be, right? The first component is going to be given to us by striking out this row and this column, and the derivative is going to be zero minus partial g partial u. Uh, similarly, the second component is going to be given by striking out this and this, which leaves you with, oh, that should be a g, not a r. Partial g partial v. Uh, and finally, if you strike out this column and this row, we're left with the determinant of one minus zero. Um, I don't know why I put those brackets here, but um, I guess I should need to put some brackets here. If we, want, if we want the length of this, which is the thing that we'll ultimately need, um, then we can just go ahead and take the square root of the sum of squares of this, uh, and we're left with the square root of the sum of squares of partial g, partial u, plus partial g, partial v, plus one. Okay, so remember, we're just coming up with a new equation for a surface integral when the surface is spe specifically given by a function. So really not doing anything new, just coming up with a, with a shortcut. So here's the shortcut. If S is given by a function G of two variables, which gives you back a, a scalar, right? So a scalar surface. The surface integral over F is equal to the double integral over a new region D, D um, of F evaluate it at r, although I wrote it this way. Um, so you have to take x for u, y for v, and z gets g u v, and then you multiply by this, um, well, you're multiplying by the cross product of those r directions, right? But this is not, this is just a reformulation of um, what I wrote here, right? This, it's the same thing. Okay, but this, this assumes that z is the thing, right? That we have uh, z is equal to a function of x and y. Right? We can really do this um, in any of the directions, right? If y is given as a function of x and z, or if x is given as a function of y and z, um, then we can rewrite this equation for all of those corresponding directions, right? But it's, it's just sort of, sort of rotating your coordinate system. So, so mathematically, it's, it's equivalent. We might screw up signs later. We'll discuss that. Okay, so here's um, here's a question again. So I'll try to work it out on this thing, and I'll, I'll I'll use this as an emergency emergency backup. Okay, so you want to evaluate the double integral of s y ds, where s is the surface given by um, z is equal to x plus y squared. Okay, so in the slides I will. In the slides, the way that it's being done 
is by utilizing this equation that we just developed. But why don't we instead, when I write it here, just to give you some sort of variation, we'll just do it the old way, right, and see, and see if that gives us the same answer. Right, so we know that this is equal to the double integral over d um, of f at r u v uh, multiplied by the length of this d a. Okay, so what if our surface is given by z is equal to x plus y squared, then uh, the collection of points s is equal to uh, r u v is equal to this vector function specifically, so you take u, you take v, and then the third component is x plus v squared, such that u, v is in what? This is the, this is the relevant question. Okay, so they, they say x, x goes from 0 to 1, and y goes from 0 to 2. So same thing here, right? u, v is in 0 to 1, cross 0 to 2, and this is our new, well, this is our, our region D. Okay, so what was our f? Our f of x, y, z was y. This means f evaluated at r, u, v is what? I'll write you one more line. F at u, v, u plus v squared. Hmm? V. You guys remember how to evaluate functions at, at, at points? Like what, if, if, x, if f, x, y, z was y, what is f, 2, 2, 2, 1, 3? Say one, yeah. No, this, this is concerning to me. This should be immediate. Right, you're just saying x gets two, y gets one, z gets three. The same thing goes through here. You're saying x gets u, y gets v, and z gets x, uh, u plus v squared. Right, so, because this, this is the key part of, of, of doing surface integrals. You need to be able to do this type of evaluation. Okay. In any case, um, we worked out that f uh, evaluated at our uv, it gives you v. Now we just need the, um, we need the length of R u cross R v, which is what? Okay, so R u is going to be 1, 0, 1. R v is going to be 0, 1, 2 v. Right, I'm just taking partial derivatives over this uh, vector. And then the top just gives us our unit component directions. Let's work this out. The first component is 0, 1. The second component is 2v minus 0. And the third component is 1. Did I do that right? Trusting you guys to, to help me out. No, I already screwed up. First one. OK, so that's a minus. Second one. 2v, 0, that's fine. Third one, 1. OK, so the integral uh, should be what? So we're working over d. Uh, we have a v here. And then we need to multiply by the length of this, which is what? 1 squared plus 4v squared plus 1 squared square root uh, d a. Jeez, I feel like this is going to go poorly. Oh no, we're still on the we're still on the straight and narrow. Okay, so let's let's work this out. So integral integral. We know that our region D is given by this rectangular region. So u goes from zero to one. Okay, so if we do du dv, we know u goes from zero to one. We know v goes from zero to two. And I need to multiply v into here. So what does that give us? That gives us v 
times square root. This should be a 2v. My 2v squared. Yeah, it's the square root of the sum of squares, isn't it? So I have to square 2v. You really got it. I can't hear anything. Two v squared is four v squared. Two v bracket squared. Uh, yeah, I can do this. Cool, cool. No, it's better to stop me than to let me make an error that will propagate. Uh, okay, so this equals two plus four v squared, which is equal to. Okay, I can take a two out of this, so that's root two. 0 to 1, 0 to 2, then you got v1 plus 2v squared, u dv. Okay, so we have root 2 integral 0 to 1, du integral 0 to 2, v1 plus 2v squared, dv. Okay, almost there. This is root two, this is one minus zero. What's the integral here? Okay, well, let's work it out. Okay, so we're gonna have, yeah, but we, we can, we can, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do it the pro way. Okay, because we need 1 plus 2v squared here, and then a 3 half, right? Because we subtract 1 from 3 halves, we're going to get a half, which means we have to cancel that 3 halves with the 2 thirds. Um, chain rule is going to give us what out of this? 4v? So we need the v, but we don't need the 4, so... Did everyone follow that? You want me to go in a little bit more detail, or...? Any feedback, guys? Go or stop. Go or more detail. Well, let's let's not trust me, right? Let's just look at let's just look at this and see. So I claim this is the integral. So what's the derivative of this? Well, the derivative of this is going to be three halves times a quarter times two thirds uh, times one plus two v squared three half minus one, which is a half plus times the product rule, which is 4v, which is equal to what? Okay, so this 2 cancels with this, this 3 with this, this 4 with this, v1 plus 2v squared a half. Okay, so that's how I do integrals. I'm just, in my head, trying to construct something whose derivative is going to, going to be the thing that I, I've left from. That, that's just skill. You, you could use leap skills, by the way. You could just do... Um, uh, substitution rule if, if you want. Right? But at this point, you really got to start employing shortcuts because time is going to be the thing you're going to be working against on, on the exam. Okay, so I haven't really finished this yet. Can I, oh. Because we need to take this as v goes from 0 to 2. This is going to be root 2 times 1, so let's forget about it. Uh, we're going to have a 2 and a 4 here. That's a sixth. Uh, one plus two times two squared. Eight. Three halves minus one plus zero to the three halves. Root two over six. Nine to the three halves. Okay, nine to the th nine to the half is three cubed is twenty seven uh, minus one root two twenty six over six, which is uh, two go root two three times thirteen. I didn't make any mistakes. 
It'll be a miracle if these things match up. Yeah. Come on, I'm the only one happy that I got something right. I guess because I'm the teacher, right? Anything less would be probably a cause for concern. Okay, so it wasn't that fun. Okay, let, let's continue. So, much like our other uh, integrals, we're going to have this rule about integrating over regions which are given uh, by unions. Right? So if you have a surface, uh, and this surface is a bunch of surfaces that have been glued together. Right? So you have a piece of a surface here, and then you glue something here. And provided this gluing um, satisfies some mathematical properties. Right? But more or less that the, the, you shouldn't have really weird intersecting boundaries. Right? You can have half a circle and then go flat and then move up. Right? But these seams have to be seamless in some sense. Right? But the practical consequence is, if you're asked to do a surface integral over a bunch of surfaces, you are permitted to break the integral up into pieces, right? And then tackle the pieces uh, together. Jeez, is it really six? This is what happens when I write. It takes three times as long. I still finish earlier than Bjorn. That's not a good thing. That means he's giving you better, you better value for your money. Find me IRL, man. Okay. I didn't, I drew this, it took me a long time, then I took it out. Because <laughs> I, I want to be able, we need to be able to visualize these things without me giving you the picture. Because you will not be given the picture. I've been kind of babying you in that sense. But, okay, so we have a good comprehension of what some shapes look like. You can visualize a sphere, you can visualize a cylinder, you know how planes cut in space. Right, so if you're given three surfaces, um, so the question says something like you're given a cylinder, given, uh, you're given the unit cylinder given by this equation, uh, then you're given a base that says you can't cut underneath z equals zero, right? So you imagine you have a, like a cylinder, you have a disc at the bottom, like a circular disc, which is its floor, uh, and then you, you have this lid, which is given by z equals one plus x, which is a plane that looks like this, right? So if you had to draw this somehow, this is going to be terrible, but it looks something like this. Okay, so you have a lid, right? All right, something like, oh, well, that's already terrible. I want to do this. Okay. So this is z equals zero. Here you have z equals 1, uh, and this is s3, this is s2, like the base, and then, and then the rest of it is s1. Okay? So it's asking you, what is, this, what is the surface area of this shape? Right? So if you're given like a jar, the surface area of the jar is the surface area given by the lid, the surface area given by the base, and the surface area around. This would be a sensible way to calculate surface area given a tube. I just cut the tube up the center and lay it out flat. Okay, so the, what this means is that I'm just going to do this integral by breaking it up into three surface area integrals. Okay, so let's do this one by one, and I'll use the slides this time because I, I have a lot of end of exercises that I, that I want to get to. Um, but if you need clarification, tell me, and I can write it on the, on the thing. Okay. So let me just write down what we want to evaluate. We want to evaluate uh, z ds, uh, where s is given by x squared plus y squared minus 1. Um, x squared plus y squared is less than 1, uh, and z is equal to 0, and z is equal to 1 plus x. Okay. So choosing S1, S1 is the cylinder sides. How can we parameterize the sides of the cylinder? Why don't we use the cylindrical coordinate system, right? Um, because the cylinder, the cylinder has fixed radius, we're only going to need two parameters, right? So you, we assume that we're unit distance away from, from the origin. 
then we need to say, well, you're permitted to be at any angle, and you're permitted to be at any height. Right? That, that will describe the surface of the cylinder. Uh, well, you really can't be given any angle and any height. More specifically, you can give me an angle between 0 and 2 pi. That's the full revolution of the circle. Uh, and the heights are given by, uh, well, let's look at this picture, 0 to 1 plus cos theta, right? Because this was poorly explained by me. Uh, we need to know, so we can start as, at z equals 0, and we end at 1 plus x, right? But in cylindrical, what is x given by? Is it? I know I wrote it, but is it? I'm just making sure that I didn't make a silly, silly mistake. You no, know, I think x, x gets cos theta. One cos theta. If x gets one cos theta, then one plus x is equal to one plus cos theta. Right? Which means that our z component can range from minimum zero to maximum one plus cos theta. Right? The height that we're moving is totally dependent on the angle that you're going to be given in, in there. I hope you can see that. Right? You, you sweep out an angle, and then you're limited by how high you can go from this sloping, sloping plane. OK, so our angle can be any angle. And there is z is a type 1 region right, where we go from 0 to some height that's dependent on theta. That's fine. We just have to make sure the theta integral is done first. What are the components that we need? Well, we have an r, so now we're going to need the length of the cross product of those two things. So the derivative. A partial derivative with respect to theta of that vector is minus sine theta, cos theta, 0. The derivative with respect to z is 0, 0, 1. Okay? Lots of zeros. That's excellent. We love zeros when we're doing determinants of, of matrices. So continuing, um, this is going to be equal. So the first component, again, is given by the determinant that's left when you strike out this column in this row, which is cos theta minus 0. Then you get. Uh, Second one should be what? Did I make a sign error? I'm so paranoid that I'm going to be making sign errors this whole, because it throws everything off. Why did I put sine theta there and not minus sine theta? Oh, because I have to invert. Yeah, so if I strike out this row in this column, it's this minus this. And minus minus sine theta is positive sine theta. OK, the last one will be easy. We strike out this row in this column, 0, 0. OK, perfect. So the uh, length of this vector is going to be given by the square root of the sum of squares. And in this case, the sum of squares collapse to 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. Cool. All right, so that component of our integral is going to, the contribution will be a unit. So we don't even have to, to look at it. Okay, thereby, the original question, the double integral of the surface area given uh, over z over s of, the double, the surface area over s1 on the function z ds is equal to, um, so this is, uh, right, so we're going to have integral over d, f of r, what were our things this time, theta z uh, times the length of this, dA. We just computed that this was 1. Um, if f of x, y, z is z, then what is it when we uh, evaluate it at our cylinder? Right, that will be 1 plus cos theta. No, no it won't. Let's see what I wrote here. No, it's, it's z. z. Z is z. We have a z. Right, so we don't have to replace that with anything. I just have to make sure that it, what was the, yeah, the original function, um, I just need to see what our r was. Okay, so if our r, theta z is cos theta sine theta z, right, this means that f at r theta z is equal to f of 
cos theta sine theta z is equal to, well, z. Right? Z, gets, z gets replaced with z. Okay, so that gets us to here. Um, I think I permuted, oh no, that's right. Um, so the integral of z is z squared over half. Am I losing my mind? Wouldn't be the first time. No, th this is right, right? Because we take z squared half and evaluate it at 1 plus cos theta minus 0. So I just took the half out of it. Okay, so when we, when we move from here to here. I did skip a step, sorry. So you get 1 half 0 to 2 pi 1 plus cos theta squared, which is 1 half. Uh, and then you can multiply out. You get 1 plus double the product of the middle, which is 2 cos theta plus cos squared theta. But we, then we can use a double angle formula, replace cos squared theta with 1 plus cos 2 theta d theta. Uh, now we have everything linearly with respect to uh, cos. That is, there's no higher power, so this should be easy to take the integral of. Uh, we're left, so the integral of this is 3 halves theta plus 2 sine theta plus 1 quarter sine 2 theta. We take that from 0 to 2 pi, uh, and you evaluate properly, and you get 3 pi halves. Cool beans. Just two more to go. Okay, so now we want to work at S2. Yeah, sorry, these problems take a really, really long time to do. So when you're doing them at home, do you know what the expression festina lente means? You Aussies don't have to learn Latin. It means hurry slowly. Right? So it's a Latin expression. Right? So the, take some care while you do this, and you'll end up spending less time doing your homework. S same advice I will give you for your exam. Hurry slowly. Uh, OK, so here we're, we're dealing with the base. So the base, we have z equals 0. So we have the double integral. We want the surface area of 0 over s2, which is 0. Right? That, that one's easy. OK, so now we have this, this sort of slanted lid. Um, s3 lies above the unit disk. That is to say, the z component has to be uh, non-negative. Uh, we also know that we can be anywhere, uh, that x and y squared can be anywhere on the interior of the unit disk. Uh, so if, if, if we're here, then we know that z could start, oh, sorry, we need to be on here. Uh, so that means given our x position, we know where we are uh, on, on the z. And right? so if, if we're at x, then we're at 1 plus x in height. Okay, so we can change this, the double integral over the, over, z, over s3 on z, right? where now z is 1 plus x. Uh, it's given by this. This is by the shortcut method that we worked out from before. But you could just as easily substitute the, in fact, I would probably just forget the fact that we did this simplification. If you just use the very first one, um, this one, it will work for everything. I'll, I'll go, although this violates the, what I'm telling you about being short on time on a final. But again, you, I think you guys are permitted a crib sheet, aren't you? Plus, we're including a formula sheet. And I put my foot down, and I had Bjorn put all hyperbolic, co uh, hyperbolic trig on the formula sheet. Because I don't want another uprising. Um, OK, so let's, let, let's work this out. Uh, f, in this, ca in this case, is z. That means the partial derivative of f. Ah, uh, sorry, the, the, our f, in this case, is 1 plus x. So this means the partial derivative with respect to x is 1, and its partial derivative with respect to y is 0. I screwed this up again. This should be a z. So you get um, I shouldn't have done two things at the same time. But if you substitute one, one, and uh, if you substitute in our z here, you're going to get one plus one, one plus one squared plus zero squared. Uh, but since we need to figure out what our new region is going to be. Uh, it's going to be more effective to compute it in polar, right? We're trying to integrate within the unit disk. Right? So it's, it's naturally then to convert to polar and say, okay, if we're in the unit disk, um, x gets our cos theta. We need to take the radius of our circle from 0 to 1, and we also need to move from 0 to 2 pi, right? 
Uh, you don't even, this has nothing to do with, with surface integrals per se. This is just a standard conversion to pull, right? This is everything in XYZ, and now we have everything in, in R and theta. So don't forget about the Jacobian down here. Okay, so I can take this root two out and then distribute that R everywhere else. That gives us this. Uh, let's do the integral with respect to R first. So we're gonna get R squared half plus R cubed over three cos theta. Uh, taking that top minus bottom, right? So evaluated one R and then uh, minus R evaluated at zero. Uh, that's gonna give us a half plus a third cos theta. Do one more, cos theta integrates to minus sine theta. No, 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 cos theta integrates to sine theta, and one half will integrate to one half theta. Right, so you have half theta plus one third sine theta from zero to two pi, and you work that out, and you get root two pi. Right, you'll get a pi from here and a zero from here. Any questions before we move on? I put a lot of it, like I, I worked out a lot of, I went through a Stuart and I picked out all the red questions, the ones that are the hardest, and I did them. And I'll, if I don't get a chance to do them in a lecture, I'll make sure to put them in your notes. Because right? I think studying examples is the best way to learn, to learn this course. So I want to provide you as many examples as possible. Okay, anyone seen this before? So if you take a strip of paper and you make one twist in it and then you connect them, you get what we call a Mobius strip. And the Mobius strip is a really interesting type of surface um, because it, uh, well, it's unorientable. Right? Like, I can't really describe it without giving away the surprise. But let's all imagine that we're walking on this surface, right, along that dotted line. And suppose you're painting the ground as you're walking. What happens? Suppose we're painting in green. We're gonna walk, start painting in green, and we're gonna walk along here, continue, and then underneath, so we're, we're behind now, we're walking on the other side of this, other side of this, other side of this, other side of this, and suddenly we come out of here on the front again and end up back where we left. So, how many colors have I colored the Mobius strip? One color. How many sides does the Mobius strip have? One. You should all be confused, right? This is where differential geometry starts coming into play. What happens if the geometry of the space that you're working in is different than what we're used to? Here's another question. Okay, so suppose you're standing on the, on the Mobius strip and you're saying this, is, this way is up, right? So suppose you're standing here and you're saying this way is up. So imagine you're on the globe, okay? We're in Australia where up is the opposite of the actual world, right? So if I'm in Canada, I'm pointing up, I'm pointing, well, away from the sphere, right? And you guys are pointing away from the sphere as well. But the, the point is, if I, if I come from Australia and go back to Canada, we're, our notion of up is the same, right? I can go back to Australia, it just continuously moves, right? Same's not true in the Mobius strip. Right? If you stand here and you're saying this way's up, I can walk all the way around to where you're on the other side saying, well, now up is the opposite direction, okay? This notion of being able to say which direction is up um, is mathematically what we call orienting yourself on a surface. Right? And since we can orient ourselves on surfaces, there must be surfaces which we can't orient ourselves on. The Mobius strip is such a surface. But if you want to continue in mathematics, you can start studying, um, well, how does calculus work if you're working on the donut rather than the sphere? Right? And, and, and it does matter. Okay, so now that I've shown you Mobius strips, I'm gonna say we are not well equipped enough to be able to do calculus on unorientable surfaces. That you have to start doing manifold calculus. But we will be able to do calculus on orientable surfaces, which is normally enough, right? We wanna work on, again, most of you are physicists, you're interested in the real world. As far as I'm concerned, I've never come up uh, into a situation where I, I've needed, where I was on an unorientable surface. Although you can make a Klein bottle if you really wanted to. 
So Klein bottle is like the two-dimensional two version of this. Um, it's like the bottle, which has only an inside. But how this has one side, you can create a 3D version of a bottle which has no, well, it either is all of the outside of the bottle or all the inside of the bottle. Okay, maybe I'll just show you. Internet Explorer. There may be a fine bottle animation. Uh, okay. So there, oh, okay, let's just do this. So I imagine this is, this is how they're going to construct the Klein bottle, right? You've got a cylinder, or at least the surface area of the cylinder. Uh, this is a process called deformation, where all the surfaces that you have are like clay. As long as you don't rip holes, you're fine. Puncture through, and you come out. There you go, that's a Klein bottle. You, you can go home and look at this, but the point is this thing, if, if, you, if you come in through the top here, you're, you're going to come, come in and move out. This thing only has one side. There's no inside or outside of this. It's either all inside or all outside. And you can actually make it. And they're, they're pretty cool. Anyway, so this, this is what you can, uh, you know, you can learn about these types of shapes in differential geometry. It is actually very interesting. Though maybe not that practical. Okay. So, we will have a sort of boiled down or uh, a little bit sort of non... We're going to have a very simple notion of what an oriented surface is, right? Because if, we, if I give you the mathematical de definition, it, it's not going to really make that much sense. If you have two sides, right, either one side and the other side or an outside and an inside, you are orientable, right? A piece of paper is orientable, right? So this is side one, other side. Right? Uh, basketball is orientable. Right? There's the outside of the basketball and then there's the inside of the basketball. Mobius strip wasn't orientable, only one side. Klein bottle, not orientable, only one side. Right? So this is the distinction that we're going to make. I don't think, we're going to always give you surfaces which are orientable. I don't think we'll ever ask. Right? But this is going to give us a problem. Okay, so not really a definition, but what we're going to use as their definition. A surface is oriented when there is a normal at each point, right? So you have a surface at any one of its points, you need to be able to give an up. What is up at this point? <coughs> and you need to be able to give an up direction at everywhere but the boundary, right? So if you're working on a piece of paper, you don't need to give, well, there is no normal here, right? Because there's no secant to be constructed. You can have secants in this direction, but there's nothing defined here. Right? But that's fine, you don't have to work out the boundary. Because at each point there are two normals, right? you can either point up or point down, um, we can orient surfaces in two ways. Right? So the main difficulty with working on oriented surfaces is that we have to agree which direction is up, because this is going to change our signs. Right? If your up is reverse of mine, you're going to get the negative integral. So we're going to have to make a convention. First, recall what it means to find a normal vector on a surface. Right, so if you have some sort of surface which is given by a function of two variables, uh, we studied this in one of the very early, earliest lectures, in order to get the um, normal on that surface, you take the, uh, well, negative reciprocal of the tangent uh, and then normalize it, right, which ends up being the negative partial derivative of g with respect to x, negative partial derivative of g with respect to y, one, uh, and this is the length of that vector that's above. So this, this thing underneath here, the den denominator, is the normalizing um, scalar. Uh, when there is a positive one here, we call this positive orientation. Right? I could have negated this whole thing. I could have taken these negatives off and put them on the one. Right? That would have also been a, a, a normal, a unit normal. Right? But we're saying when the z component is positive and a unit we define that to be positive orientation for, for only that reason, right? Because we have to, we have to agree on up. Right? There are some rules in mathematics which, which don't get introduced uh, logically. They just get introduced because we need to practically be able to uh, distinguish between these things. 
And sometimes the physicists make the opposite assumptions that the mathematicians do, right, just to be fun. Uh, okay, so here's my proof. If f is a surface parameterized by that vector function, x, y, g, x, y, and we'll always be able to do such a parameterization for functions, uh, then the normal is given by the cross product of those two vectors, which you can work out. Right? Normalizing gives, gives the result. Maybe next time I give this course, I'll do proofs before the proposition. Okay, so this is our definition of posi positive orientation, which is really just a convention. If S is a smooth orientable surface given parametrically by R U V, then the direction of posi positive orientation we're just, is just given by R U times R V. Right? We, we have a natural positive orientation that's just given to us by virtue of the coordinate system we're working in. Right? So th this would be backwards. If you, if you reversed V and U, you would have the opposite normal. But the point is, given a coordinate system that induces a natural positive orientation given, given by this. Right? If you're just saying, okay, well, take, take, your, take the cross products of the partial derivatives in both directions and normalize it. Right? That, that will be your positive, positive orient, orientation. Okay, what is the orientation induced by the sphere? Well, let's take a look at the normal. Right? Uh, if we have a sphere of radius A, we know that we can parameterize it in this fashion, right? This is the spherical coordinate system. We also developed an equation for the length of the cross product earlier on, uh, and that ended up being a squared sine phi. Thus, the orientation induced by r phi theta is given by this vector, 1 over a r phi theta. This is a trick question because the direction depends on how we parameterize. Right, if I would have taken r theta phi, all of these signs would be reversed. Right, so again, your, the, the orientation depends on the order of the parameters. You can have an x, y, z rectangular system, which is different, but ultimately equivalent to the z, x, y coordinate system. Right, so just keep that in mind. If, whenever you make a mistake with these type of questions, check your signs. This is why I'm so paranoid this week about making sine errors. Here's a convention. If you have a closed surface, right, that is a surface, um, you give me a solid region, and then you just ask for the boundary of that region. Right? That, that's what we call a closed, closed surface. The positive orientation on a closed surface, so like imagine a basketball, um, is the one that points outwards from, from the surface itself. And so if you have a solid object, there's obviously a direction which is pointing inward to that solid object and an orientation pointing outward from that solid object. And we're going to choose the outward orientation to be the positive orientation. I have pictures. Sputnik. Everyone's too old for that? Someone must know what Sputnik is. Cool. Got a head like a toothpick. It's like Sputnik. Married an axe murderer? It's a movie? No? Okay, I'm here all week. Dip your waitress. Okay, so here's a sphere. You have to imagine that it's solid, but certainly the surface area is closed, right? It's bounding some solid object. Arrows pointing out from the inside of this sphere, positive orientation. Arrows pointing inward to the solid, negative orientation. Okay, so uh, the name of the game for this whole course was we did something for functions, uh, and then we do the same thing when that function is instead a vector field. Right? So functions are things that take points and give you scalars. Vector field are things that takes vectors and gives you vectors back. And we also want to be able to integrate through these type of things. So if S is an oriented surface with unit normal, uh, and F is a vector function, and the domain of F is included in S, the surface integral of F over S is this, defined to be this. And this integral is called the flux. Um, I was hesitant of making this either a definition or a, a, a proposition, but the important thing is here is that we, this integral is equivalent um, to taking this integral, which is not a vector anymore. Right? So this is, this is the integral of a vector field dot product another vector field. This is the integral of a vector field dot product normals, which turns it into a scalar and we know how to integrate over scalar functions. 
Uh, this is the one proposition that you're going to need in order to practically work out these integrals. So if S is given parametrically by R, uh, then the flux over S of the vector field F is equal to the double integral over F dot product the cross product of these partial tangent vectors over the square region A. Right? And again, vector, scalar. And we know how to integrate scalars. Here's a proof. Suppose that S uh, is given, well, S is the collection of points which can be generated by R, right? Uh, where UV is taken from D. That's sometimes called the parameter space. Then the double integral over S of F dot DS, that is equal to the double integral, what am I doing here? Ah, yes, right. See, I, I want to replace this with, a, with an A and a D. Back here, this was just an S and, and an S. Because how do we how do we do d d s when s is in a regular sh shape, right? So we can move from here. Uh, this is equal to by definition. Uh, this unit normal is given by r u cross r b over the length of that vector. This is equal to the double integral of f evaluated at the evaluated at r dot product the length of this normal dot product the length of this normal again, dA, right? So since these cancel, right, uh, this is how I got from here to here. This is this trick in, in math where you, where you multiply something, something by one. But it allowed us to turn the definition of flux into the double integral over a scalar function, which we can use earlier techniques developed in this lecture to accomplish. All right, so the, the, the thing to notice here is that f dot this normal is a scalar function. So we're taking the double integral over a vector field and turning it into a double integral over a scalar function. Question. Find the flux of this vector field across the unit sphere. The unit sphere is parameterized by what? Well, spherical set R to 1. All right, so here we go. We have uh, unit sphere is parameterized by sine phi cos theta, sine phi sine theta cos phi where phi, the height angle, is given by 0 to pi, and theta, the polar angle, is 0 to 2 pi. Thereby, if I take the vector field f and I evaluate it at r, right, this is x, this is y, this is z, right, so f evaluated at this vector gives you z, cos phi, y, sine phi, sine theta, x, sine phi, cos theta. Next, we're going to need the length of this. Actually, we don't need the length. Next, we just need the uh, normal of r phi times r theta, which we developed earlier in class and took a little bit of work. But we found that that was equal to sine squared phi cos theta, sine squared phi sine theta, sine phi cos theta. And thus, if we take f evaluated at r and we take the dot product of by this vector, uh, we get cos phi sine phi sine theta sine phi cos theta dot product sine squared phi cos theta sine squared phi sine theta sine phi cos phi. We actually do the dot product, right? So that's the this times this plus this times this plus this times this. So we have cos phi sine squared phi cos theta plus sine cubed phi sine squared theta plus sine squared phi cos phi cos theta. Perfect. We can do some simplification here because uh, cos phi sine squared cos theta, and we have another cos phi cos theta sine squared. So we have two of those. That's where this two comes from. And a sine cubed phi sine squared theta. And finally, now we can do the flux, right? Because by our proposition, the flux is equal to this derivative, uh, which we know to be equal to this derivative, uh, this integral. So we can work this out. Um, so there is a sum here, so I'm going to address these integrals in two parts. Right Here's the double integral over the first part, double integral over the second, because it permits me to rewrite 
both of these terms like this, right? because I can remove the theta part out and the phi part out. Uh, and if you work out these, this sort of glossing over this, uh, you could work this to 4 pi over, over 3. Right? So I didn't, from here to here, just look it up when you, when you get home and confirm that I did those integrals properly. <coughs> Almost done. So if S is an oriented surface with upward orientation given by a function z, then the double integral over f, the, du the flux over S on f is equal to the double integral over d of f dot product minus gx minus gy, 1 dA. Again, this proposition is redundant. This proposition is just what happens to the former proposition we developed when we know that the uh, s is given in a very special manner. Right? We know s is given by a function, and that simplifies things. So you can use this. But again, you can do all the questions using the old one, but there is a shortcut if you want to use it. I don't use the shortcut because you have to remember twice, twice the amount of stuff. Okay, so proof s can be parameterized by uh, r x y uh, to the vector x, y, g, x, y. And so the dot product between that vector field f and the cross product of those uh, tangent vectors uh, is equal to f dot minus gx minus g, y, which is, which is what we want. Do I have a picture for this one? Yes. Okay. I think this is the last. Yeah. This is the last one, but it's a doozy. <laughs> what is the flux? over the vector field y, x, z, when s is the boundary of the solid region given by the paraboloid and the plane. That is what is the flux. OK, so who can describe to me what s, the shape of s is? What's a paraboloid? Yeah, so a paraboloid is when you take a parabola and you spin it right, to get a parabolic shaped vase. Um, Notice this is 1 minus x squared plus y squared. So it's downward pointing. Right? 1 is the largest value it can attain. So it's a downward pointing paraboloid. And then you cut it by z equals 0. Right? So you have to imagine that you have some sort of parabolic shape with some sort of z equals 0 floor. Right? Looks like this. Okay. Next, we have to be careful about our orientation. We need to make sure that we're posit positively oriented. That is, whenever we use a normal, the normal on S1 has to point outward like this, and the normal on S2 has to be pointing down. Right? We need to be pointing outward from the solid at all points. Right? So just keep that in mind when, when, we're, when we're answering these things, because we're going to compute a normal, and you should verify that it's pointing in the right direction. OK, so let's break the integral up into two pieces, S1 and S2. So we have S1 is oriented upward, right? pointing positively, and parameterized by this. Right? This is an easy way to parameterize it, x, y, 1 minus x squared minus y squared, where d is the unit disk. Our last proposition tells us that we can employ this shortcut, although I am missing a bunch of <laughs> uh, other things. But I'll use my magic screen here. I believe this should look something like this, the double integral, well, the flux over this is equal to the double integral over d f dot minus g x y minus g y 1 d a. OK, so expanding on that, we know our g in this situation is 1 minus x squared minus y squared. Um, that, right, we also know that f is, f is y x what is our f? Let me write this down. So we know here our f is y, x, z. So this means that f evaluated at r, r is what? Uh, well, okay, this is, this is f evaluated at x, y, 1 minus x squared minus y squared, which is equal to y, uh, then x, then z. Cool. 
Uh, if g is 1 minus x squared minus 2y, then minus gx gives you what? Um, minus, minus 2x, which is 2x. Minus gy gives you minus 2y. Minus minus 2y, which is 2y. Uh, and then derivative of z with respect to z is 1. OK, so let's, let's do this. We can take this integral and do the dot product, and that gives us this, right? 2xy, uh, 2y minus, uh, sorry, this gives us 2xy, then 2xy, and then 1 minus x squared minus y squared. We collect like this, and what do you think the sensible thing is to do now? Someone said it. Polar. So we switch to polar. Right, remember, d was the unit disk, so we want to go r from 0 to 1 theta from 0 to 2 pi. Don't forget about the Jacobian. Uh, so 1 gets 1. x gets r cos theta. y gets r sine theta. So 4xy becomes 4r squared cos theta sine theta. Minus, and what is x squared plus y squared in polar? r squared. Right? So that, that becomes a minus r squared. We distribute this r across the whole expression to get this. Um, and from here on in, it's just basic, standard, sin single, variable calculus. Right? And we get pi half. OK, so we have the contribution of the surface area of the paraboloid. Right? Now we want the contribution of the floor, which, remember, has to have a downward pointing orientation. Right? And this is why it's important. We're going to be adding all of the contributions together in the end. Right? We, and we have to make sure we're adding when we're supposed to be adding and not, and not top taking away. So just be very, very careful. Sign errors when calculating flux are a, it's a, well, it's a disaster. OK, so let's convert. We want to do this. Um, so on the unit disk, right, so here's the unit disk. Here's a vector. And here's our coordinate system. Without knowing anything about the unit disk, what is the normal, what is the unit normal on this disk? You're on a flat surface. Right? Your normal is always going to be perpendicular to how you're standing. Okay, someone said it. It's either straight up or straight down, right, on this unit disk. We know. By, sit, like by looking at the question, that we want the straight down version of, of the normal. So what is the straight down unit normal on the disk? Okay, You don't have to calculate it. This is the unit normal. It's the downward pointing unit normal. That This is a vector of length 1. So it's a unit. And so instead of, you, you might just have to intuit the normal. I think, you, I think you'd be doomed a little bit if, if you wanted to calculate. Well, you wouldn't. You just waste a lot of work right, computing the unit normal on, on, on the disk, right, when you can just say, oh, it should be down. OK, so that's how I replace this unit normal with, with this right, by, by intuition. And now we can just carry, carry out the rest. Well, it's not very interesting, because when we, when we end up taking the dot product, you get 0. Right, so the contribution of the floor here is 0. So the final answer is the sum of these two integrals, pi half plus zero, it's pi half. Next week, last lecture before the one that we will uh, do a review lecture on, we're going to finish with Stokes' theorem and Divergence' theorem, uh, which are basically generalized Green's theorem, which will complete your vector calculus training. I have end of lecture exercises, but again, you can leave if uh, this is not something that you're interested in. So take a couple minutes, leave, and then I'll continue. Guys, anyone can confirm that this is showing up on the echoes? Yeah, it is? Perfect. And this is stupid. They should put the visualizer here. So I can write the desk. It's so rude.
Okay, after hours lecture. Let's, let's sort of bring down the lights, settle in, change into your jammies. Let's do some math. Anything's your pajamas if you're drunk enough. Okay, so what have we learned? Uh, we're going to do three questions, each of increment. These are questions that are very difficult to take in from, from the textbook. Um, in fact, this one, I, I didn't compute the same answer as the textbook. I'm off by a factor. So, and I couldn't find my mistake. I think that the textbook answer is wrong, but I'll be happy if you can catch my mistake. So what are, what are we being asked here? Uh, they're asking us to calculate the surface integral over the function y, where s is given by this r. So this is great. They're, they're telling us exactly how the uh, system is parameterized. OK, so depending on your book, I think this is 17.7, question 7. Well, we want to do the double integral over s, y of ds, knowing that r uv is u cos v, u sine v, v, uh, for u v in d, which is equal to 0, 1, 0 pi half. That seems to be that looks to be some type of helix, right? U cos v, u sine v give you a position on the circle. Uh, sorry, a position on the, no, no, the circle. And the last component is moving you off linearly. And I don't know how useful this is, but it's just, it looks like a helix. So, helix. Okay. We want to calculate this. We know that this is equal to what? Well, we want to do the double integral over d. We want to take f, which in this case is y. And we want to evaluate this at r u v. And then we want to multiply by the length of this. Okay, so if f is y and r is this, what do we get when we evaluate f at that vector? Can't do this, we're, we're doomed. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll write it out in full once more, but we're going to have to get, get used to this, right? We have a function f, okay, I'm gonna, this will all be erased afterwards, but we have a function f of x, y, z is equal to y. Then we want to ask what is f when it's evaluated at uv, which is equal to what is f when it's evaluated at u cos v, u sine v, v. Okay. So evaluate this function at that vector. Is that clear to everyone in here? You better not be lying, shaking that head. This, this is just function about this. So this is, this is the problem I, I encounter with almost all students of mathematics. This just can't, do not understand how to evaluate functions. Right? These, are, these are just things that you give objects and other objects are spit out at you. Because right? I, I don't think any of you would have a problem doing this. What is it? One. Okay, so please. From now on, that, that has to be immediate. So what did we decide that F evaluated at R U V was? It's U sine V? Yeah? Uh, and then we need this. 
I probably should have calculated it ahead of time, but let's do that now. Okay. So R U cross R B equal to. Okay, we got to look at this and take the derivatives with respect to U. Okay, well, that's cos V. That's sine V zero. Uh, then we have. Please watch my signs. Minus u sine v, u cos v, 1. Right. Oops. And then we need to do it over these components. So what do we get? First position, sine v minus 0. Second position, 0 minus cos v. Third position, u cos squared v minus minus, so that's a plus, u sine squared v, okay, which simplifies to what? Sine v minus cos v, and then u, right? Can confirm? This means that the length of R u cross R v is equal to the square root of the sum of squares in here, so sine squared v plus cos squared v plus u squared half, which is equal to, well, that cancels, well, becomes a 1, so we have 1 plus u squared a half. Okay, so what does this mean about the original problem? Well, oh, I should have made that a double. So I want to continue moving from here. This is going to be equal to the double integral over d u sine v times 1 plus u squared half d a. Okay, so what's our d though? Our d is 0 to 1 and 0 to pi half. Right? u v. This is equal to uh, u sine v times 1 plus u squared half uh, du dv. So u goes from 0 to 1, v goes from 0 to pi half. Okay, I can move this around, not at all. No, a bit. So this is, uh, boy, integral 0 to pi half sine v dv integral 0 to 1 u 1 plus u squared half v u. Okay. This is equal to what? Integral of sine v is Is that the right sign? You guys got to be far more confident than this on your test. Right. Write it down then. Write down what the integrals are. Uh, and then what's the integral of this side? Well, we're lucky, right? So I did this early, earlier on, so I'll just I'll say it out loud. Okay, so I have 1 plus u squared to the power of 3 halves, right? Because that's how I got a half back, which means that this 3 half is going to fall down which means I have to multiply by two-thirds. Uh, there's a u here, which is good, but out of here is going to pop a 2u, so I also have to divide by half, and then take this from 0 to 1. Okay, what's cos at pi half? All right, so th I'll show you how I remember this. This is cos, right? Uh, this is pi half, this is 
well, I know that this is pi and that this is 2 pi. Okay, so pi half is here, so it's 0. 0, uh, zero minus, minus 1. Is that correct? Let me just write this all out then, because I fear I'm making a mistake. This is minus cos pi half minus minus cos zero times these cancel. Uh, I'll just put a third out here. You get one plus one squared three halves minus one plus zero three halves equal to one third cos of pi half zero cos of one is one this is two two to the power of three halves minus one to the power of three halves Okay, one third square root eight minus one, which is two root two minus one over three. Oh, I think I may actually have corrected my mistake. That's the answer. Jeez, guys, we probably only have time for one more, so why don't you pick? So I have a flux question. I have surface area question. Maybe we should probably just do the flux question. Yeah? I'm only going to do one component of it because it's, it's long. <laughs> it took like three pages. Um, okay. And everything else I'll, I'll draft up and, and put into your notes. So, what is the flux of this vector field along the boundary and I'm gonna I'm gonna draw okay again so we have a cylinder with a lid a disk and a base a disk and so we have I think okay this is what makes this question hard how is our, this is not normally how we're given a cylinder. What axis is this cylinder lying on? So normally the, act, the cylinder is given like this, up and down, along the z-axis. Right? For this cylinder, that would, I should stop doing this maybe for the echo, but <laughs> jerking off an element or something. Um, for this cylinder, it was x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now we have x squared plus z squared equals 1. And so the reason that the cylinder was moving up and down the z axis is because z was the free variable. What's the free variable here? So the cylinder is along the y axis now. Okay? So this, this is where sign and this is where things get messy. Because right? this is now the coordinate system that we're working in now looks like this. Because remember, up. Up is now something that matters, right? And up, in this case, is y. Because right? we have a cylinder that's long y, right? So down here, we're going to have x and z, okay? So we have to orient ourselves now. Well, here at the bottom, where y is equal to 0, 
we have normal vectors that have to point like this. On the surface here, we have normals that are pointing outward. That shouldn't be much of a problem. At the lid here, we have vectors or normals that are pointing like this. Okay. What direction is up? Hmm? That's the direction we have to move in, but what's the vector? What is the unit, what is the unit normal direction for up? What is this vector? Well, zero, one, zero. Oh, I thought you said zero, zero, one. Okay, 2,000 points awarded. Okay, but up is totally dependent on how you're oriented in, in the coordinate system, right? This is the point I'm trying to make. Okay, so our up-down axis is y, what we're normally used to being z. Right, so as we move on, just keep, the, keep this in mind. Right, so we have a normal up here, which is this. Our normal down here is going to be this. And our normal on the other thing is to be determined. Okay, so let's call the top lid S1, the bottom lid S0, and the surface, whoops, S2. No, S, I did this wrong. This should be S1, this should be S2. Okay, so break the integral into three pieces. That's what we will do, yeah. But we still have to make sure that we're pointing in the right direction. Right, because the, the surface of the outside is gonna be given by what? Uh, a height and an angle, right? If, depending how you rotate, it will reverse the direction of the normal. And if I'm moving around a circle clockwise, the normal maybe will be pointing up. If I'm moving counterclockwise, Maybe the more, more normal is pointing down. Right, that's why this question is a little bit interesting, because the normal, we have to orient the higher disk clockwise to get this direction, and the bottom disk counterclockwise to get the negative direction. So that, that's why I'm just saying, we need to be mindful at least about how when we calculate these normals or the contributions won't have the right, right signs. Unfortunately, I'll probably only be able to finish this single contribution, but why don't you go home and, and do the rest? It's good practice. Um, and then you can double check when I, when I put this on online. Okay, so flux along S1, right, the cylinder, uh, has what? Well, we have S2 is the collection of points given by this parametric equation. So we have to hit all the points on the surface of the cylinder of unit, of unit distance, right? So it's one cos theta, uh, one sine theta, right? We want to polarize on the x, z uh, component, and y is free, right? Such that theta and y are taken from zero to two pi, uh, y goes from zero to one, right? We have that from the original setup, right? I guess y equals one, y equals zero, uh, and then this is our d. Cool. So to do this question, we wanna take the, so the flux, that's equal to the double integral over S1 of this, which by definition is equal to the double integral over d of f evaluated at theta y, dot product r theta across r y dA. And hopefully r a is a rectangular region. All right, continuing, 
This is the double integral of V, and here's the million dollar question. Okay, so our F in this case was xy5. Right, so maybe I'll write it so I'll write it small. F is equal to xy5, which means F at R cos theta y sine theta equal to what? I'm, I'm just going to put it in here. What's the first, what's the x component? Oh, sorry, maybe I'll, I'll put in one, one extra thing. What's the x component? The y component? The z component. Cool. Uh, and now we need to multiply by the cross product, which I neglected to calculate, so let's just do that now. So we need this plus this, and remember that r is equal to cos theta y sine theta. So what do we got? We got sine minus sine theta, zero cos theta, y zero one zero i j k what do we got we got zero minus cos zero or minus sine theta which means that the length of this is the square root of cos squared theta plus sine squared theta to the half, which is one, which is great, because I can just put this here. Oh, I'm an idiot. We don't actually care about the length of this vector. Right, I care about this. Okay. So let's actually take this dot product. So we get minus cos squared theta. It's the first. And y times zero is zero. Five times minus sine. That's y sine theta. D theta. Dy. Theta goes from zero to two pi. Y goes from zero to one. And we get. I'm going to take a minus out of this. Minus 0 to 1 dy, 0 to 2 pi, uh, cos squared theta plus 5 sine theta d theta. This. is equal to, well, the, the first integral is going to be 1 minus 0. That one's easy. The second integral is going to be what? Well, look it up in your table, but the integral of cos squared theta is 1 half theta plus 1 quarter sine 2 theta. And 5 sine theta goes to plus 5 cos theta, provided I haven't made any mistakes. We take this from 0 to 2 pi. Should this be a minus? I thought I took the minus out. You're right. You're right. Thank you. This is exactly why I keep you guys around. Go. Okay, so what are we left with? That's a minus. Okay, so observe that everything in here has a theta in it. Oh no, we have sines. Okay, so we have one half, two pi half, plus sine of four pi, which is zero, and that's a zero, minus five cos.